Anyway, um, switching gears as we get ready for this really big, incredible Oklahoma City bombing interview, we wanted to bring up why Oklahoma is still important, and that is because the globalists will do it again. They've been waiting for the right time, and we're in this storm of political dissent. Uh, they're looking to crack down on this country and all of it. And even people like Glenn Beck, who've cast total doubt on 9-11 truthers and all the rest of it, have raised the possibility that the administration, Obama administration, or the Democrats, or for that matter, Glenn, anyone on the Republican side, would be willing to stage another Oklahoma City bombing to drive home a political agenda and blame their political enemies. So what we're saying here is that there's a perfect storm of blaming domestic extremists, blaming patriots, blaming anyone who's outside of the left-right paradigm. And whereas the globalists would love to stage another event, seize more power, and corral the country back into their narrow paradigm of spectrum of thought, they will also blame anyone working outside of that spectrum, even a, a puppet uh, speaker like Glenn Beck, if they can, in order to drive home that agenda and defuse any dissenters who have a significant voice, you better believe Alex Jones is at the very top of that list, as well as so many other great alternative news researchers. Now, uh, we do have that Oklahoma City interview coming up, but first, we wanted to play a few clips from A Noble Lie, an incredible film that covers so much of that very big lie, that total false, false flag in 1995. Uh, which was really just a precursor for the big one, 9-11. Let's play now clips from Hoppy Heidelberg, who we have joining us in just a few moments. Let's play the first one. It was just too important, just too important to the American people to know what happened there for me to keep quiet because nobody else was going to speak up. The other grand jurors were petrified because they observed on a daily basis the kind of intimidation tactics that were used by the Department of Justice attorneys to attempt to keep me under control. And when they found out about the FBI visits to my home, I really shook them up. Now they seem scared to talk to me in the men's room. And, and mostly it was a John Doe 2 thing, because as you remember, it's the greatest manhunt there's ever been. And then all of a sudden, hey, he doesn't even exist. If he doesn't exist, what was the deal about the manhunt? I mean, things like that, that was continually coming out. And so we are joined now by the man you just saw in those clips, Hoppy Heidelberg. He was on the grand jury before being dismissed, as well as the filmmaker, James Lane. The film is a noble lie. We have it at Infowars.com. Powerful expose of all the story that was never told in the mainstream media at the time about the Oklahoma City bombing, as well as plenty of unanswered questions. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me now. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So uh, to some, try to give a basic summary of what is the compelling case here? What are the major things that people perhaps never heard about? Well, <clears throat> the bombing was designed to get the anti-terrorist bill passed. The anti-terrorist bill had been written and was before Congress in 93, but they couldn't get it passed. Uh, well, it was in 92, actually. And so in 93, they had the World Trade Center, the first World Trade Center bombing. And had it been successful, they would have been able to get the anti-terrorist bill passed, but it was not successful. And so they had to come to Oklahoma City in 95, and uh, uh, they killed enough people. They had a big enough body count in 95 uh, that they got the anti-terrorist bill passed. There were three uh, buildings in consideration, and uh, Oklahoma City won one, and I use the word strangely, but we won because we had the daycare center and we were the only federal building with the daycare center in it. And they correctly figured that it was the pictures of those little babies' bodies in the paper every morning on the six o'clock news that would get the anti-terrorist bill passed. And of course, they were more than happy to flaunt out the victims of the tragedy, but they were never interested in truth, and they particularly did not want this grand jury to go forward. Uh, among other things, I've got a New York Times article from 97 with the Attorney General in Oklahoma and, and other figures saying, this is a waste of money, it's useless, and we don't need this investigation. 
but it's a good thing it went forward anyway. What can you tell us about the grand jury investigation itself? Well, there's actually two grand jury investigations. I served on the federal grand jury investigation that happened in 95, and then Charles Key had a multi-county grand jury seated a year or two later. So uh, we need to be more specific. And, and uh, right. mine was the federal grand jury that happened in 95, within a month or two after the bombing. Speaking of the multi-county grand jury with Charles Key, uh, they actually, once they got that impaneled, they actually turned the grand jury over to their enemy, Bob Macy, and he actually used the grand jury to investigate the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee. So the exact opposite of what it was, uh, all the signatures and, and motive behind in, in paneling the grand jury to begin with. I told Charles Key that was going to happen, and I begged him not to have that multi-county grand jury seated and his lawyer I have grave questions about his lawyer his lawyer assured him that it was going to be their grand jury and they'd be in charge and I said Charles it's not going to happen that way I said you'll be lucky if you don't get indicted and he almost was for for a perjury they said uh, well, could you go back then to the grand jury investigation you were on and, and what were the major things that happened there, including the intimidation and the rest of it, sir? Yeah, well, the, the first thing, we were given a handbook called the uh, Grand Juror's Handbook, and I studied it, and I highlighted it, and underlined it, and everything, so I was prepared. So the first day that we were seated, uh, they told us that uh, we were not going to be allowed to question the witnesses. And man, I thought, what in the world is that? And I opened my book up right quick. And of course, it said that's what we were there to do. And so I pointed that out to him. And I said, I'm going to question the witnesses whether you like it or not, because the book says that's what I'm supposed to do. And we finally, uh, we took a break for a while and we finally came to a compromise. They said, okay, you were going to let you, and I was the only one that was allowed to question witnesses, we're going to let you ask questions of the witness, but you have to give us the questions in writing in advance. And I thought that thought about that a minute, and I thought, well, I know how to get around that. I'll give them one question, and then after that question's answered, I, depending on the answer, I'll go to my next question. And there's, I'm not going to give them all the questions I'm going to ask, because how can I? I don't know what I'm going to ask until I get the answer to the first question. And so I got around that. Uh, but the, but it turned out it didn't really matter. There wasn't there were no witnesses that they called that knew anything about the bombing. Not a, not a thing. It was the same thing that the FBI did. You know they've got mountains and mountains of 302s where they said, look at all the investigation that we've done. But they never asked the important people the important questions. It was just to 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 build a a, a mountain of paperwork to say that oh they had done their job. But all the people, and, and I, I can't tell you the, who testified and what they actually testified to, because that's not right. But <clears throat> the people they called to testify was somebody that had seen Tim McVeigh at a gun show years earlier. I and mean, that's not relevant at all. In fact, not a one of the witnesses that they called to the grand jury was actually relevant to the bombing. It's a, it just amazing. It was just a dog and pony show. Shows how the judicial branch has been compromised. I mean, they were complicit in, in you know, pushing forward the official cover-up story. Well, what are the major smoking guns that, that independent investigators have discovered over the years? Who do we know that was involved other than the two accused? And, <clears throat> and uh, other breaking evidence you can give us. Well, of course, it was an inside job to get the uh, legislation passed. Uh, some of the things that we have learned since is uh, I've learned to calculate the uh, decline in blast pressure with distance so that I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was no ammonium nitrate bomb exploded there. And even if there were, there's not possible that it could have done any damage because the government reported that the size of the bomb would have generated 500,000 pounds per square inch of pressure, which sounds like a lot, and is a lot. <clears throat> and of course, I was never allowed to have structural engineers come in and tell me how strong the columns inside the building were designed to be. I found out much later that they were designed to withstand 3,500 pounds per square inch of pressure. 
Well, it sounds like on the face that <clears throat> 500,000 wouldn't have any trouble taking out 3,500. But the problem comes in is when you go to calculate in the decline in pressure with distance. In the formula, you have blast pressure over the distance cubed. Well, we use 10. It may have been 12. I, I didn't actually measure the width of the sidewalk down there. Uh, it, but when I got to it, I mean, they, they tore all that out. There's no sidewalk anymore. But it, I, I'm familiar with the building, and it was at least 10 feet. Could have been 12 feet to the nearest column. So we'll use 10 because that's easy to calculate. And you put BP for blast pressure over 10 times 10 times 10. That's 10. That's distance cubed. And you multiply that out, 10 times 10 times time, and you end up with 1,000. 10 times 10 is 100, and 100 times 10 is 1,000. Uh, so you got 500,000 over 1,000. So then you divide the 500,000 by the 1,000, and you're left with 500 pounds per square inch of pressure. Not even close enough, not any chance strong enough to knock out any column in that building. Didn't they say by the time it actually got to uh, the deepest bite in the building, it was about the equivalent of uh, 10 hair dryers? <laughs> well, there's no way that, that pressure can travel in a straight line down the front of the building in the eastward direction and then stop and turn into the building and make that large indentation and take out all of those massive columns way back deep in the building, much further away from columns that were right in front of the bomb. And I've got photos of those columns and the sheetrock is not even damaged on the bomb. You can see the gray you can, from the false ceiling to the top of the column. It's gray. That's the concrete. From from the fault ceiling down, it's white, and that was the drywall. That was the sheetrock that was painted white. And you can see that the, the bomb didn't even tear up the drywall, the sheetrock. I mean, if it can't damage sheetrock, it's not going to damage concrete. And in the documentary, we show the actual photographs of this. Columns that were, were closer to the bomb uh, ha still has the sheetrock on them. We've got the photographs. Columns yeah. farther away were supposedly destroyed by this, you know, this uh, truck bomb with ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. Uh, we've got uh, street interviews where people, you know, that day were talking about the additional ordnance that were removed from the building, disarmed. we got people from the military talking about a second large device being disarmed you know the day of uh, the later in the day of uh, April 19th general Parton uh, his report shows where the additional ordinance would have to be placed to create the damage pattern that we do that we see at the Murr building <coughs> the the biggest bite in the building is offset from the crater uh, and again the crater was much smaller than what the the official report says but it, it would have had to have gone forward and taken a right hand turn it's like the the magic bomb it's like the magic bullet you know and of course, right. the film is A Noble Lie, which I think is a great title. It brings up 9-11 uh, as well, where obviously physics is not what they're interested. They're interested in the emotional perception of this great tragedy. And, and so, of course, the media cover-up is a large part of this whole lie. Uh, could you get into some of that and what you saw with the local media as well as the national media? Well, of course, the, uh, it started out... Uh, with the media telling the truth, but that didn't last 24 hours. Then they changed everything. The only media that continued to tell the truth was Channel 4, a TV station, K4 TV station. It told the truth so strongly that it was purchased by the New York Times and every employee with that station that was working on the Murr Building bombing was fired and not only fired but blackballed and have never been able to work in tv again another thing that we saw was um uh Frank Keating's brother, Martin Keating, wrote a book, uh, The Final Jihad, and it, it the copyright date on this was actually uh, originally 1994. The subsequent publications that came out, uh, they changed the date to 1996. Well, why is that? Well, when you look at the characters in the in the book, it's about someone setting off a, a bomb in Oklahoma City by a federal building being picked up by a state trooper. The character's name was Tom McVeigh, and with an original publication date of 1994, now this really calls into question, uh, you know, what kind of foreknowledge that uh, the governor's office had. 
I had an appointment with Martin Keating, and I drove all the way to Tulsa to interview him. And I spent the night there and got up the next morning. I had like a 10 o'clock appointment. And so when I called him to confirm my appointment and get directions, he told me that Frank had called him. Now, Frank Keating is was the governor of Oklahoma at the time. Anyway, he said Frank had called him and told him that he couldn't talk to me. So I didn't get to talk to uh, Martin. Uh, later on, he said, oh, I didn't write that book till after the bombing.